So I am Julie Shayu Woodard. I am the president and CEO of Smart Home America. We are a 501c3 nonprofit based in Mobile, Alabama. We say we're tiny but mighty. We are super flexible. I come from actually wildfire. So I was a wildland urban interface specialist. I was a, and these, this is my cred for all you firefighter people. I was red carded, thank you very much. Um, I was basically um, a PIO for a very long time, but also an education outreach specialist. And my job was to work with communities and get CWPPs together. And when the Firewise program was being birthed, because I'm 52 years old, so I was around at that time, um, I was supposed to be trying to get communities in the Deep South up to speed on what was a Firewise community and why did they have to do. And so Alistair and I were joking, not joking, about the fact that we've been having this wildfire mitigation conversation and since we picked on the Clintons. Um, it started with big projects under James Lee Witt under the Clinton administration forever ago, right? But we couldn't get those things to stick. And one of the reasons we couldn't get them to stick was because insurance didn't care at the time. So back there, we could do all this work, but it wasn't a pain point for insurance. So they weren't at the table, and they really weren't making an effort. Fast forward to Katrina, which is how our story at Smart Home begins. And straight up, I'm not talking about wildfire. So I'm going to be talking to you about rent, wind, rain, hail, flood, and how we've changed that storyline. And I'm not sure that we can do it with fire, but we're being asked now to figure out how to do what we did with wind and rain, um, with fire. So we were smart home in 2009, before anybody knew what a Lexus was and like refrigerators that put your grocery store list together. So we were before smart home was a thing. And for us, it's that a structure's built to take severe weather events, be able to take a hit. Yes, there'll be damage, but not complete displacement and loss that there's affordable insurance wrapped around that structure so that that family has the economic means to evacuate, come back and be able to recover very quickly. It's energy efficient, so no matter what the temperature is outside and what that economic outlook for that family is, they can afford to live in that house. And then and only then do we care if you put really cool stuff in your house. Because if it floods, burns down, or blows away, then all of the cool technology really didn't do much. Okay, so all the blue dots, basically a heat map, right? So what we've been doing for a very long time is moving the science from IBHS into the world at the ground and state level. And we've been focusing on fortified home, fortified commercial, and then the last two years, fortified multifamily. So that's the science that comes out of IBHS to how do you make a structure be able to get through really high convective storms with wind, wind, intrusion, wind and water intrusion and hail. The big test case. So we've been doing this for a long time, since 2009, but we've done it differently, and that's what I'm gonna tell you. But in 2020, we had a hurricane come through, and if you're not from a hurricane world, then you, you don't know how we think about things. But for us, a category two storm isn't really a big deal. We don't like go clear out the shelves at the store. We don't, you know, like we get ready to like sit and watch movies and stuff while the storm's passing through. Sally was different. It moved at two to four miles per hour. So we had sustained 110 mile an hour winds for a really stupid amount of time. So we had over 17,000 structures that had been re-roofed, so an existing house, re-roofed or built new to the fortified home standard. And they were in that eye wall, which is the most intense, scary, damaging sector of a hurricane for eight and nine hours. So structures in the real world are not built to stay in 110 mile an hour winds for eight and nine hours. So we saw levels of, levels of destruction that we just wouldn't have seen had it been moving. Most hurricanes move and they're in and out. And so they can be pretty intense, but they're not just sitting there pummeling everything. Of those 17,000 structures, we say this a myriad of different ways, less than 1% of them had enough damage to have claims. That was the game changer. That was the data point that everybody was looking for. Part of that was that IBHS, for the first time in a, well, ever, 
was successful in getting some of that claims data shared with them. The insurance industry holds that in a vault, within a vault, within a vault. And then they have men in black sitting outside of the vault. They will not share claims data, which by the way, if they did, would make all of our lives a lot easier and we'd fix a lot of problems, but they don't share that. And they've got all these valid reasons why. Um, so that for us was different. That just changed everything. The whole conversation changed, especially for the insurance industry, because they could look at their data and say, oh my God, we did not write a lot of checks. That worked. So that sort of catapulted that conversation, because really everybody had been doing everything, as well as voodoo, to make sure we got hit with a hurricane, because we held the most um, structures. So if you go back to this, we have, there's about 40, there's a little over 53,000 structures designated. So that means they've been re-roofed or they've been built to the fortified home standard. Of those 53,000 nationally, we hold 43 plus in Alabama. And the majority of those, 27,000, 28,000 are re-roofs. So these are structures that have been, they've been there forever and they've gotten a new roof into that fortified level. And then the other half, minus a little under 800, was built new to, a gold, to the gold level. So fortified roof is not different than a regular roof. It's just installed differently, and it's got a few extra things. And Alistair came up with a cool way of saying, you're nailing it down, you're sealing it up, and you're locking it up, locking, locking it in, locking it in. So basically, the easiest way to describe it is that you're switching from a smooth shank nail to a ring shank nail. It's got rings on it like a screw. You are sealing up that space between the decking on your roof. So if you look at a deck with a roof without stuff on it, there's a space where those sheets of wood are together. And then you're locking in the way that the shingle product or any other product that meets that, that wind code for where you are, you're making sure that that starter strip or that edge isn't the weak point when the wind starts blowing. That house was re-roofed under a grant program we have in the state. So homeowners at the first working day of every quarter can apply for a $10,000 no match grant to re-roof to the fortified standard. We had um, over a thousand neighborhoods that were affected in various ways from this storm. Most of the neighborhoods that had grant re-roofs or just houses that were built new or re-roofed look like this. Neighborhood had blue tarp, fortified house did not. This gentleman, we have testimony, everybody was at his house. He actually met some of his neighbors for the first time because he was the dry house. That's a sad statement. Um, this is what we've done. That is what every state goes through in a nationally declared disaster. Takes, it used to take like about six years for a state to come back or whatever got hit to come back. We are not back in the ninth ward of Louisiana from Katrina. SBP's in the room. I'm in Louisiana every other week. We are not back on the Mississippi Gulf Coast from Katrina. I travel a lot, and every so often somebody will say, oh my gosh, I was driving down Beach Boulevard, and y'all just have the most beautiful open spaces. And I'm like, those are not open spaces. Those are homes that will probably never come back because they didn't have enough insurance and they can't afford the insurance now. And they cannot build high enough for the velocity wave action that's expected in a hurricane. So it's, it's just different. We don't come back like we used to. So this is now what we look like in our two hurricane zones in Alabama. So very smaller footprint of having to rebuild. Every day we have roofs going on <clears throat> and new builds happening to this level because we have a suite of policies and codes in place. Basically, we ha you can call it whatever you want. It's a puzzle, it's building blocks, it's Jenga. Um, we, over the last almost 15 years, have basically just worked at figuring out what are all of those things that have to be in place for you to flip a market? And when I say flip a market, meaning that whether a homeowner will ever understand how their house was built, to what code it was built, what does it mean to have a code-built house? Like, no one understands that. 
What they do know is the incentives that are in place to get them to make a different decision. We as Americans know how to maintenance our cars. We start being taught that at little bitty ages. Nobody still today teaches us that you should maintenance your house. You should do checks on your house to make sure that things are not deteriorating and you're not having deferred maintenance and you're making sure that for many of us, your largest investment is gonna continue to be there when bad weather comes, right? We don't think that way. So we've put stuff in place in the background so it's just happening and making sure that it's happening. So these are the things in a, in a hurricane, tornado, flood area, these are the things that we know have to be in place for that to be sort of automated. And we started figuring that out, really, really started figuring out in 2011 and 12. So my job and my staff's job, wherever we're asked to come help, is that we have to convince all of the entities that touch a built structure why they should care about building differently, how it looks for them financially, because no one is going to do this unless they understand the money. And once we get them there, then they take that on, and we don't work with consumers. We don't talk to homeowners. I was in government for a long time. I don't put a lot of time into homeowners. For me, that isn't a good use of my time. What we've done is we focus on who the homeowner writes a check to. Homeowners don't trust the insurance industry, but they let them draw for their, from their bank account every 30 days. Homeowners don't trust builders and roofers, but they write a check to a builder or a roofer, and that person at that time is who they trust to make a decision about their house. So we get that person to understand why it's important to do and how it affects them overall. What we've been doing for a long time is taking the science out of IBHS and basically integrating it at the local and state level in policy and code so that it's happening. We've also been working very hard to replicate what we're doing in Alabama, what we've been doing in Alabama. So that no match grant program is really, really important. Homeowners will not do something to their house unless you pay them. That is just the sad truth. And you have to pay them with either a grant, an insurance discount, some combination of that, maybe the permit pulls to re-roof get rebated back so it comes off their bid price from that roofer. It, there's a myriad of ways to do that, but we've got incentive levels in place where it's working. The feds are finally on board. This past, the last two years, the Federal Registry actually changed its wording for the first time ever to say that if you're using a federal dollar, you need to prove that you did it in a way that it mitigated so that we're not putting that same dollar back into the same place. Um, fortified and the suite of products that come out of IBHS is the easiest way for a state to prove that they have done that wisely. Federal Home Loan Bank Dallas launched their affordable housing for 2023 with scoring for Fortified in it for multifamily. And they started a grant program, which is direct to homeowner, not really. <laughs> you have to have basically an intermediary there for the homeowner. They can't just walk into a member bank, but they can get that funding. SBP is not on here. You will have to forgive me. I will do penance. Um, we've been working with SVP for almost 10 years. And actually, I screamed through Slack at the staff, oh my god, SVP's in the room. Why are they not on this slide? Um, because they've been doing Fortified for a very long time. IBHS and Smart Home has been working with them for a very, very long time. And it's just what they do every day. This slide was because these are the entities, Post Laura and Ida, those hurricanes um, in Louisiana, that we brought new nonprofits into the fold on, on how they're rebuilding post-disaster. This was our mic drop. So Smart Home was called, before, before COVID, we were called into the Office of Community Development, and at the table was Louisiana Housing Court. Louisiana Housing Court is the same as any other state's housing finance, so they put the money into the market for LIHTC, tax credits, affordable housing. They asked us to come sit down. Whenever we got, when we got the phone call, we called IBHS and we said, hey, come, come with us. Um, they wanted to do something different. They wanted their multifamily workforce housing to be resilient. This was 
95, 97% complete, was not, did not have a CO, was not open for people to live in yet. When Ida passed over it, Ida was a cat four when it made landfall. The winds that affected this was 135 miles an hour approximately. A half mile down the road, same developer under code built this structure. These families actually live in these houses, this housing now, as is the property manager. That still looks like that, except it's overgrown now. Um, this is our future. This is where teachers and police um, officers and firefighters live. This is your workforce housing. It is built above the flood because this is a flood area and it went through a cat four and it had very minimal damage. So the families that would have been living there would have come home and been able to start immediately um, getting back to life and recovering. More importantly, what if for some reason they had to let their insurance lapse for a little while? So to me, this is, this is the future, right? It's for those for our homeowners that cannot always have insurance and may never have insurance, they have to be able to live in a structure that can take repetitive, severe weather events. Yes, there will be damage, but they're not gonna be displaced because that is the reality of a huge portion of our population. We are not here yet. We are just having this conversation. I told somebody yesterday that like, the like one fourth of the nail of my pinky toe is dipped right now into this conversation. Like that's how like we're not in it yet. But this is like that next thing. Like, can we do what we've done to fix high risk areas, insurance problems and the way that we build? And can we do that with wildfire? I don't know. Um, we're going to start that conversation with some of you. We're, we're working in Colorado post martial fires. We, fingers crossed, we'll hopefully get um, a house there to a dual designation. Fortified does not work in places that like uh, wind and rain and water intrusion is a high risk, so it's not necessary in a lot of places. But in the area that the Marshall fires happen, they get 145 mile an hour winds like on Thursdays. Um, that is a roof issue right there, period. Separate from the fire, fire is a whole nother issue but they have a severe hail issue there too. All of that affects your insurance. Insurance is at the table right now because insurance goes out of business if you can't afford to buy it. And their 25 year projections are very clear that they are out of a job. So they are now at that ground level trying to figure out how to make, what do they need to do to be part of the conversation to get an affordable product out there, but also to cover what they have to write out. If they don't take enough money in to cover the check they have to write out when they're rebuilding, they go under as well. So, so they're very much involved now in how do we work with you? That's it, ma'am. <laughs>